Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to try to tackle a question that's been bugging scientists for a pretty long time. The question in regards to the evolution of planets like Venus and Earth. Because as we know, both planets sort of started like this billions of years ago, and at some point Venus probably looked like this. Yet over time it changed dramatically, turning into something a little bit more inhospitable to any kind of life. With ridiculously high temperatures and very high pressures on the surface. Yet Earth didn't. Earth didn't just remain hospitable, but actually improved its conditions over time, leading to the evolution of complex life. So what exactly happened between these two planets, and why did one turn into something like Venus, yet one remained very hospitable? Now we've discussed some of these ideas in the past, and actually many of these ideas are based on some of these papers, like this one right here, that you can find in the description below, that do actually discuss the possibility of Venus being the first habitable world in the solar system, but in a nutshell, the main conclusion from most of these studies result in a relatively similar conclusion and a relatively simple answer. Volcanoes. But not just any kind of a volcano. A very specific type of a volcano that doesn't really exist on Earth right now, but has existed many times before. A volcano that actually kind of resembles what you see on this hypothetical planet. And also, the types of volcanoes we know existed on many other objects, including the moon, visible as these dark patches on the surface. These are known as the mare. And here we're talking about a type of a volcanic eruption known as LIP, which stands for Large Igneous Province. This image right here points at some of the very well-known LIPs on the planet, with many of them actually being really large in size. For example, one of the larger ones, Siberian traps that you see right there, very likely resulted in one of the largest extinction events on the planet, with the slightly smaller one, Deccan traps, also being associated with the extinction of dinosaurs and actually followed the collision from the asteroid, both of which very likely led to the extinction event. And so unlike typical volcanic eruptions, such as the one you see right here, or the one we got to witness in January of 2022, when Tonga eruption occurred, LIPs would be a little bit more difficult to imagine but they essentially would be huge in area and would also be active for thousands or possibly even millions of years, in the process releasing huge amounts of gas, which almost always dramatically affects the atmosphere, which in the past almost always led to some kind of a dramatic change in the biosphere, very often extinction events. As a matter of fact, the majority of major extinction events that happened in the last 500 million years were all directly correlated with the occurrence of some kind of an LIP with only one of them being potentially caused by an asteroid, in this case the one that killed the dinosaurs. But as I mentioned, it also involved an LIP not so long afterwards. So it was probably a combination of both. And so in other words, these were usually very long periods of volcanism lasting at least a few thousand years on average, resulting in a deposition of hundreds of thousands of cubic miles of various types of volcanic rock on the surface, which is why they're called igneous provinces. And the last one that happened on the planet is the one known as the Columbia River Basalt Group. This is located in the northwest part of the US, and it very likely lasted for a few million years, and potentially occurred even twice. With this very likely resulting in some kind of a shift of the biosphere as well, but it's not entirely clear how exactly it changed the conditions. Although intriguingly, the hotspot from this activity is still kind of going on in US right now as well. That's essentially the Yellowstone supervolcano. The plume, or the hotspot in this case, moved a little bit to the northeast, but over time also weakened quite dramatically. And so the Yellowstone National Park is basically the culmination of that last LIP that happened on planet Earth. It wasn't really that dramatic though, and it wasn't really that big. But it did create huge basaltic provinces that can be visible across the northwest part of the US. And in the last few years, the scientists were able to directly track exactly how the plume progressed with the influence of the hotspot visible in this particular image. Which is essentially how would the scientists today believe these particular igneous provinces very likely work. Underneath the crust, there is some kind of a hotspot that results in huge eruptions that last for thousands of years. But like the typical hotspots we have today, like the ones in Hawaii or Iceland, the hotspots that form the large igneous provinces are very likely a result of an extremely large emission of magma that seems to occur occasionally, but then dissipates over time. Although the actual mechanism is still a little bit unclear, mostly because we don't really have any current examples to look at. And judging by the effects these particular events had, we probably don't want to have one anytime soon. But what does this have to do with ancient Earth and ancient Venus? Well, we know these definitely existed on Venus as well. There's actually quite a lot of evidence based on the radar photography of the surface. 
For example, the volcano Ma'at Mons that you see right here seems to be surrounded by a relatively large area, very similar to a typical LIP. Some of these lava flows you see in the picture here are actually hundreds of kilometers across, implying some ridiculously powerful volcanic emissions that very likely happened here and possibly lasted for thousands or even millions of years. And the main explanation for the current conditions on Venus today essentially involves what the scientists refer to as a runaway greenhouse effect. And so initially both Venus and Earth very likely had quite a lot of these various volcanic eruptions, although the chances are maybe Venus had just a little bit more, at least based on what we see from its surface. But more importantly, it didn't just have more, but it might have had them more frequently. Or to be more exact, some of them occurred in a relatively short span of geological time. In other words, the planet had really nice conditions on the surface, but just like Earth, it would occasionally get these LIPs. Although unlike Earth, these LIPs were way more frequent, and sometimes they would even coincide. Now, based on the calculations from Venus, it does seem apparent that the volcanoes here were a lot more frequent, and definitely much more dramatic in size. Yet on Earth, in the last 3 billion years, all of the large LIPs happened relatively far away from one another at very different timescales. Although in the last 3 billion years, at least 100 LIP pairs and possibly 10 triplets might have occurred within approximately 1 million years of each other. Or to rephrase this, statistically, the study discovered that in the last 3 billion years, at least a few of these LIPs would actually occur within about 1 million years of one another, which would dramatically shift the atmospheric conditions on the planet. But unlike Earth, it looks like Venus did not get as lucky. Some of the LIP pairs were a little bit too close, and resulted in dramatic emissions all at once, which very likely transformed the previously habitable planet by emitting more and more gases all at once, very likely preventing these gases from returning back into the planet. Here on Earth, for example, it's usually done through the process of plate tectonics, which doesn't exist on Venus, with every following large eruption event only adding to the conditions making the planet even more inhospitable. And once the atmosphere became thick enough, and once the conditions became hot enough, everything here started to change quite dramatically. For example, the super thick atmosphere started to slow down the planet, reducing the rotation speed to the very very slow rotation that it has today. This obviously changed the conditions even more. With every additional large igneous province event, adding even more atmospheric pressure to the overall inhospitable conditions. And on top of this, the sun has also started to warm up just a little bit, increasing the temperature even more, which altogether very likely led to the Venus we have today. But the scientists in the study suggest that all of this really started because of these LIPs that happened in the first few hundreds of millions of years, with the suggestion being that Venus basically just kind of got a little bit unlucky. With the overall probability of a large event occurring on Earth and overlapping with another event that could maybe result in something similar to Venus only being about 30%. Or basically Venus sort of got super unlucky with a few events occurring around the same time and thus causing conditions that could not be recovered from. Whereas Earth got super lucky with our planet getting enough time to recover from every major LAP, essentially trapping and recovering all of these gases through various geological processes over time. But chances are we're not going to know more about this or be able to confirm any of this until we finally once again land on Venus, such as during the Da Vinci Plus mission that's going to be launched here in the next few years. You can learn more about this mission in one of the previous videos in the description, but in a nutshell there are several missions being launched in order to explore Venus and in order to figure out what actually happened here and why it turned into what it is today. And so even though the scientists believe it was volcanoes and specifically these large igneous provinces that happened a little bit too frequently, there might be some additional discoveries later on once several of these probes get to explore the atmosphere and of course get to explore the surface as well. In the process, once and for all answering the question of is there actually still life present in the atmosphere of the planet? But we'll be talking more about this in some of the future videos as well. And so until those videos, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.